Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1981 film, The Burning. It is a slasher. It's a film that doesn't get talked about a whole lot, but over the past, mm, I don't know, like six years or so, I've heard it come up quite a few times and from people who are kind of more in the know with horror films and have said, uh, you know what lesser known slasher film you should definitely check out? The Burning. And so over that time, it's kind of gained more and more uh, notoriety in a sense. So it's become kind of one of those cult classic films. Uh, this is a, a slasher that originally when it came out, it really did get panned. It didn't do very well monetarily and therefore there weren't any sequels to it. Uh, there's another partial reason that there wasn't, there weren't any sequels to it. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. When I'm uh, recording this review, it is available for streaming on Shudder, The Burning. And I would say that before I get into any of the spoilers, because there will be spoilers since this movie is quite old. Uh, before I get into that, I would say if you're trying to decide whether you want to watch it or not, I would say if you're into slashers, if you're into 80s, especially if you're into 80s slashers at camps, staged in camps, uh, definitely give it a shot. Definitely watch it. I found it enjoyable. I think it's overrated from what I've heard from people and there are some other problematic things with it and I do have a theory as to probably why it didn't do all that well when it came out uh, and is you know doing much better now but I'll talk about that later but I would say definitely watch it it is fun enough a good enough time to watch it once for sure so anyway uh, this was directed by Tony Malum uh, who's he did a bunch of documentaries. He, he, he did The Riddle of the Sands, Split Second, Phoenix Blue, and Journal of a Contract Killer. I haven't seen any of those, so I don't really know his work. Uh, one of the things is after Malum had done this film, so in addition to what I was saying before of the film not doing all that well monetarily, and then Malum also said, hey, um, I don't want to get pigeonholed as a horror director, so he said he would not do a sequel. So between that and the poor monetary performance, that is why, or that's why it's cited on the internet, uh, there wasn't a sequel or anything. I'd say it's probably more of the didn't make enough money than anything, <laughs> because yeah, they didn't make as much money as they spent on the film, which is bad, especially back then. Uh, for this was this was a mere basically wanted to become the beginning of Miramax in a sense, so you'll kind of know where I'm going there with the next portion. Uh, it was written by Malum, Bob Weinstein, Harvey Weinstein, there's a name, um, and knowing this information, you can't unknow it to associate it with this movie, so it, it does some things to this film, to me personally, and I'll talk about that later. But uh, Peter Lawrence also worked on it, who actually, interestingly enough, Peter Lawrence wrote scripts for a bunch of TV shows, mainly kids' animated ones, including Silverhawks and Thundercats, which I loved Thundercats. Even in the high school, I loved Thundercats. Uh, and Brad Gray was also involved. Now, Brad Gray is the real writing talent involved with the script. He wrote scripts for uh, such films as The Cable Guy, Wedding Singer, Happy Gilmore, Scary Movie, and also wrote a bunch of episodes of The Sopranos. So that's the real writing talent involved here. Although I would argue there's really not that much writing talent involved in this script. Um, the directing, though, Malum, I think, did a pretty good job. There are actually some pretty good cinematography uh, moments in the film, which I'll talk about as I go through it. But um, some good technical things and, and one of the other aspects, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this has Brian Backer in it, um, so he's one of the people I really latched on to at first, and I was just like, oh my gosh, Brian Backer. Uh, he plays Rat or Ratner in uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. That was after this film, and I love that movie. Fast Times at Ridgemont High is amazing. So great. It's one of the quintessential coming-of-age high school movies. Um, Jason Alexander is in this. Most people will probably freak out most about that if they haven't seen this film before. You know, Jason Alexander, best known for being on the show Seinfeld uh, as George Costanza. And then another one that occurred to me, probably most people didn't really freak out about it like I did, but when I figured it out, Fisher Stevens is in this as Woodstock. And Fisher Stevens I love because he's in a movie I love, and that movie is Hackers. It's one of my guilty pleasure films. He plays the plague in Hackers. So when it, about halfway into the film, I was like, this Woodstock dude looks familiar. 
And I was like, I got to look him up on IMDb. So I'm looking him up on my phone. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Fisher Stevens. The Plague. So I just had a freak out moment with that. Um, this was written to be based on the urban legend of Cropsey, which is something that originated in New York, I think Staten Island specifically. Uh, there's a documentary out there actually about the origin of the urban legend of Cropsey. I forget. I think it's just called Cropsey, the documentary, which, by the way, the people who made that documentary went on to do a documentary series on the A&E channel uh, called The Killing Season about the Long Island serial killer, which is back in the news again recently because they identified one of the bodies um but that's a whole nother thing for a whole nother day but the killing season is really well done and that documentary on cropsy is really well done is my point here so check those out if you have interest rick wakeman from the band yes did the score for this film and i think the score is very strong uh especially if you just consider the time frame of this for being an 80s slasher score i think it was really well done so i quite liked it i think they that wakeman did a really good job matching it with the moods and everything that was going on there were only a few moments where i felt like the music was a little bit off from what was happening but not a big deal for the most part i enjoyed the score so this was this film was Harvey Weinstein's attempt to break into the movie business. Uh, he looked to movies like The Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween to kind of draw inspiration when they were working on this film. Now, for me personally, I'll just go ahead and talk about it now since I brought Weinstein up again. Watching this movie and having that bit of knowledge, which, like I said, is not knowledge you're going to unlearn about this film... It puts some of this stuff in different contexts. There are a lot of sexual jokes in this. There's a lot of sexuality in the film, specifically the character of Glazer, who's potentially my favorite character because of how poorly he's acted, and I think that's funny. But the actual character and how that character's written uh, is very much Harvey Weinstein, a sexual predator who won't sit, who won't listen to the words no. It's for me, and maybe this doesn't happen to other people, I really hope this doesn't happen to other people because it messes with your enjoyment of the film. A lot of the sexuality to it, a lot of this not taking no for an answer. There's tons of sexual pressure on women in this film. There's a lot of dialogue based around that. Um, it feels gross. Um, I, it, it wouldn't if it wasn't a, a Harvey Weinstein film, but knowing that he was involved in writing the script and who he became as a person... It's gross to watch now, and it has a totally different context, in my opinion. Now, like I said, hopefully that it doesn't play that way for other people, but for me, it does, so it's kind of hard for me to say I really love this film. I do like it, um, you know, if I detach my brain from the Harvey Weinstein portion of it, uh, I do like it. I think it's worth seeing at least once. It's not one that I'm, you know, super huge on. Uh, I would much rather watch a... A, another film, another slasher film from that time period that is very underrated as well, and that's My Bloody Valentine. When I saw that one for the first time, I fell in love with that film. That may be my favorite slasher film. It's really good. Work on this film actually started, this is what is reported, work on this film actually started before the first Friday the 13th film came out. Now, I kind of have a little bit of a hard time believing that because there's a lot that feels... Friday the 13th in this film, so I don't know. You know, maybe all these things are coincidence, but it feels a little weird to me. A little too coincidental. They tried to move this film as fast as possible because apparently they said that they knew this slasher craze would not last forever, so they wanted to capitalize it, capitalize on it as fast as they could, which, you know, if you're trying to make some bucks, that's what you got to do. You got to play to the audience as fast as you can. So Tom Savini actually did the effects on this, and that's why the good effect moments, the good kill moments that you get are really good because it's Tom Savini, and as we all know, Tom Savini is the man when it comes to gore effects. Uh, he only had three or four days, though, to actually come up with the cropsy look, the cropsy makeup, which, for being that fast, it looked really good. I mean, obviously at the very beginning, that's kind of like one of the big payoffs of the film is you eventually see the burnt face of Cropsey and it looks really good. It looks gross. It looks scary. It looks disturbing. I mean, it's, it's good. It's great. And, and for that to be that payoff is good work. And, you know, we expect nothing else from Tom Savini because I mean, for that stuff, he's perfection. There was talk of a sequel. I already talked about that. 
they pass on the sequel. Not going to rehash it. So the start of it's actually, uh, this is pretty normal. Like, what's going on in the storyline as far as camps go? This is normal stuff. Kids playing pranks on people. Uh, I went to summer camp a lot when I was a kid, and that's, I mean, that happened. That happened a lot. People play, you know, playing around with each other, playing jokes on them, pranks, all that. And sometimes, you know, things go a little bit wrong. That's totally true. Um, but to the degree that it goes wrong here is, you know, obviously super tragic. That creates, much like in Friday the 13th, it creates a very vengeful uh, um person who was wronged obviously not in the first friday the 13th but after that it's jason Voorhees. um so it kind of sticks with uh friday the 13th 2 and on so they're very similar in that sense um that you know negligence basically led to someone being killed or greatly disfigured which leads to rage which leads to vengeance and a super strong killer who's just going to dispatch people in the worst ways possible. So it overlaps quite a bit like that. But I did think it was kind of important in this that when the prank went wrong, that you could see as an audience member that they didn't intend for that to happen. That they didn't, that they weren't really bad kids. Like they did something, you know, kind of bad, but it wasn't really that bad. It's just things got out of hand and you know, it was unfortunate. And even when Cropsey's leaving the hospital after he gets treated for his burns unsuccessfully, uh, saying the skin grafts didn't take, the you hear the doctor's voice saying that, you know, it's nobody's fault. This was just something that happened. It was unfortunate. But Cropsey can't accept that, obviously. But the way they set it up, it's good because then the audience feels that when, you know, he's going out and he's exacting revenge, he's actually more of a monster than anything, Cropsey, because... It was a mistake. It was a misunderstanding. It wasn't intentional, you know, and, and to be seeking vengeance because of that and to just lose it because of that means Cropsy is pure evil at that point. And it's more of a actual uh, conscious choice that Cropsy has made to be that way as opposed to being forgiving or understanding the actual situation. Uh, the rhythmic tapping in this when, when the kids are like tapping on the window of Cropsy's bunk um, that was awesome. It, they made it like this rhythmic tapping, which actually became the music for that scene. And it worked really well. It was really good at ratcheting up the tension and it sounded cool and it was really rhythmic. And it was, that was one of those really inspired kind of brilliant moments in the film. I really, really liked what they did with that. The burnt arm that grabs the attendant is actually pretty gross when the guy kind of brought the other dude and he's like, you gotta see this man. <laughs> um, with the burnt arm just coming out and grabbing him, it looked burnt, it looked nasty, but it also was done with such force that you understand as soon as he gets out of here, he is pissed, he is strong, and people are going to get it. So they, with that one little moment, they actually signaled a lot, which, which was very, very effective. The first first kill scene is actually really plagued with kind of corniness, in my opinion, and that's kind of one of the issues I have with this film, is that the acting was so bad, that prostitute, when she gets stabbed, um, the stabbing actually looked pretty solid, but her acting was so, so terrible. And then add on top of that, the lightning that starts going off and the thunder during that, it's like, okay, we're going way over the top at this point, that is way too much tone it down just the stabbing and focusing on that that's enough even with the bad acting that lightning and thunder then just ooh, made it tough to watch <laughs> and then i put down oh wow glazer's acting is so bad so that dude is larry joshua and he actually went on to do a bunch of small parts in films and also did a lot of tv uh episodes of various shows so i mean he had a career after that, even though his acting was awful. But I love it because it was so awful. Like, I laughed quite a few times. You know, you weren't supposed to, but, you know. It feels like it goes way too long between the first and second kill. Um, that's kind of not cool, in my opinion. Because it's, it's like, what's the killer doing at this point between that time frame? Like, I understand you have to set up who the characters are, what they're up to. But they showed too much of just the campers before going back and checking in with what the killer was doing. What is Cropsey up to? What's Cropsey been doing, you know? 
Um, and you have all these kind of moments of where you think maybe it's the killer. It's like that POV shot, but it ends up being someone else. And it just feels like such a horrible tease. Much like in this movie where like Glazers talk and all these guys are talking about these women being teases. The movie, the way they're set it up is being a tease because it's not giving us the kills. And I understand that you need to do that or that's kind of the formula to some degree with the slasher films. But they took it way over the top. And like I said, there was way too much time between the first kill and the second kill. And that's one of my big issues with this film is kind of pacing gets messed up because of that the emphasis on the canoe trip to devil's creek and how far away it is is actually a really good setup for the kill spree you are you know going into it based off what the you know head counselor is saying is you know you're going to be going really far it's going you know you're gonna be far away from home it's very secluded all this stuff so then you know when the canoes go missing it's very, very dire situation. And you know that that's where Cropsy is and he's going to show up. So really those kids then have no way of getting anywhere. It, it, ratchet, it moves up the stakes. It makes everything way more intense. So that's good. They did a good job with that. The amount of sex and masturbation jokes is actually super, super high in this. And kind of more than I remember in any 80s horror film. I'm not complaining about that aspect of it. I actually think that those jokes are still funny. Even though I'm, you know, almost 40 years old. I still think those things are funny. But, um, yeah, it, it just struck me as like, there's so much in this. And then the, the sexual aspect getting lumped in with Harvey Weinstein was the stuff that was like, eh. Um, the camp lore like this that they have with Cropsy is an actual thing at camps. I don't know if people have actually been to camps, but like I said earlier, I did a bunch of camps when I was a kid. And yeah, that's the thing. You always hear these, these urban legends, this lore around the campfire about um, this person who died accidentally and they're going to come back because they're mad and they need their revenge. I heard a few of those when I was a kid. So it's very, you know, nostalgic when you watch it. So when we finally get that second kill, going back to this issue, it has been, al it's almost 50 minutes into the film, which is way too long, and then it's too dark. You can't even see it that well. Whatever good practical effects Tom Savini did are kind of for nothing because you can barely see it. So not only has it been forever since we got the kill, I mean, there's really about 45 minutes, um, 40 to 45 minutes between the first and second kill, which is... Not okay, in my opinion. That goes back to what I was saying about the pacing issue with it. Uh, and it's like, at that point, you're just like, is there even a killer in this movie anymore? Like, are we ever going to get back there? Uh, I like the move of the canoes being let go. Yeah, it just kind of gives you the idea that these kids are trapped. The multiple killings on the raft. Those were really good. And in quick succession, that's a really nice payoff moment after being kind of let down after that second kill. Uh, you kind of get just like this release of, oh my gosh, death, 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 death. And they look good. They look really good. But how is it that Cropsy doesn't fall into the water? Because Cropsy was going from being inside of a canoe to on that raft. And that stuff moves on water. And Cropsy's large. And there were a bunch of kids on the raft. That thing would have tipped. He would have fallen off. And what do you, when he stood up in the canoe, he probably would have fallen in the first place. So... Big old plot hole on that one. That just seemed kind of dumb. But, you know, we can look past that because we got a good multiple kill scene out of that thing. With as much of a jerk as Glazer is, it actually is even more funny when he has his premature situation happen. And then his death is, even, is made even better by the fact that we all hate him <laughs> in the film. Uh, the, 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 uh, gardening shears through the neck and then he gets walked over to the tree and stuck in the tree. That's a really good kill scene. Very inventive, very well done. And speaking of that, the garden shears as the killing instrument is a good choice. It works really well in this film. So, um, I like that being unique. I do need to point out that this, this kid Alfie, um, is not actually that much of an innocent kid. He's supposed to be seen as kind of like the good guy, the innocent kid. He's a habitual peeping Tom throughout this entire film. Like, even when he's he's he ends up seeing, like, um, Glazer get killed, what was he doing, though? Like, he was stalking him. He was, like, following him and, like, trying to watch him have sex. How many times in this film, at least three that I can remember off the top of my head right now, how many times is Alfie sneaking around spying on people? 
He's a peeping Tom. He's not a fine kid. He's not okay. For all we know, he went on after this to just keep doing that. And he became the gold, someone like the Golden State Killer. I'm just saying. <laughs> he's not an innocent kid. He's supposed to be in this, be the hero, hero, but he's not. It doesn't make sense that Todd would survive this, let's be honest. It also doesn't make sense that Alfie would survive this either. Because Cropsy, up until he comes comes up against Todd and Alfie separately, um, he kills everyone that he comes in contact with. And he doesn't, you know, hit them with something and then back off. He makes sure he does the job. He's very brutal about it. He wants to kill. He's filled with anger and rage. And so when he just, like, nicks Todd and then just leaves him, that's not believable. Then when he just uh, pins Alfie up by his arm with the chair, that's also not believable because he, he's, he's, been just, he's been killing people. Why all of a sudden does he just let up on Todd and Alfie, especially because he tries to kill Todd later? Plot holes. That stuff doesn't make sense either. It just doesn't make sense. Alfie running in the woods goes on way too long, and then we redo the same thing with Todd as he's retracing the same steps that Alfie took. This speaks to another one of these problems with the pacing in this. It's an hour and a half, and it seems longer than an hour and a half when you have scenes like this. That stuff needed to get cut down. These, are, these reasons I'm bringing up, these issues with this film are reasons why it didn't do well in the box office, especially because people had already seen Friday the 13th. And that's a better film. That is definitely a better film because the pacing, the script writing is way more tight. It's way better executed. Just saying. Um, oh, really quick, uh, going backwards because I forgot to say something. Uh, the multiple kills on the raft, that scene, when you then, they focus that camera shot on the blood running down the girl's arm, that looked really good. That was a really good cinema, cinematography moment. It was a very inspired shot, and it looked cool. It almost looked kind of artistic. And another really good shot like that was when um, we finally, when Todd is, you know, going in Alfie's footsteps, which I just complained about, but he gets into that area where it's all dark, except there's, like, some rays of light coming through, and he's holding the axe, and it, it's, it's, like, dark, except you see, like, this ray of light on the head of the axe. That was another scene that looked really good. That shot looked real cool and artistic. Um, and then in the end of this, um, it's interesting because you kind of become of become aware of the fact that the burning, the title of this film, the burning is how everything happens. All these bad things go down. That's how everything gets started. And then the burning is how everything ends because Alfie sets Cropsy on fire and dead supposedly although they were thinking about doing the sequel so ended up being dead but was potentially not going to end up being dead so just saying especially with the story being told around the campfire at the end when they kind of insinuate to you looking straight at the camera that watch out because he's out there um i definitely feel a lot like or this this film feels a lot like um friday the 13th like i've already said uh it's weird considering the timing that they wouldn't have been inspired by it in any way. It has all the trappings of it. The accident, like I already talked about, between, you know, accident with Jason, accident with Cropsy, the horny teens and them all getting it, the camp setting, all that stuff. It's very, very similar. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, also, Alfie actually almost becomes Jason at that part where someone pushes him in the water and he can't swim and he's like drowning that kind of seemed to me like it was a little bit of a um nod or jab at the friday the 13th because of when jason drowns am i right am i right um yeah and then like i said all the sexual pressuring in this film feels very different when you know harvey weinstein was involved with the script i cannot stress that enough Ugh. Uh, the film the film feels very uneven, which is probably why it didn't do as well when it came out, and Friday the 13th is way better structured as a film. The problem is this film came out a year after the first Friday the 13th. People had seen Friday the 13th. They probably saw a trailer for The Burning and thought, oh, wow, this might be like Friday the 13th because it's a very similar setting. It's a very similar concept, and then they go to it, and the pacing is all messed up. 
that huge gap of about 40 to 45 minutes of no propsy is a big, big problem in this film. Yes, you get some really good stuff at the end, but a lot of people have already been turned off by that point, and it's hard to change opinions by then. Now, all that said, I actually enjoyed the film. I know I dogged on some stuff about this, but I enjoyed the film. I didn't think it was the best. I didn't think it was as great as everyone says. A lot of people, I found it on lists of being like required viewing as far as like cult classic horror films go. I don't know if I would go that far, but I would recommend it to some people just to check it out. Uh, and like I said, I might watch it again. I don't know, but I don't feel super compelled to. I think the Friday the 13th series is way better just about I, I think I would prefer maybe every single film in Friday the 13th except Jason X over this just saying now that that might not be accurate there might be a few others I might not prefer over this but you know what I'm saying the better Friday the 13th films are definitely better than the burning uh, the other thing to point out is that the the artwork the poster art for the burning promises a lot and when it takes forever to get to that type of action, People get impatient and get pissed. So I'm just saying. Anyway, thanks everyone for checking this out. Now I'm going to give it the star rating. I almost forgot. Uh, so out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three star rating. I do still recommend it. And yeah, but I know people will have opinions. So go ahead and put all your opinions down in the comments and we will talk about it. Did you love this film? Tell me why. I want to know. Did you hate this film? Tell me why. I also want to know. But do me a quick favor, hit that subscribe button because that's your best way to repay me. If you like any video I do, this one or other ones, um, I, I really do appreciate it. Literally takes you a second, so it's very painless, but it can mean a lot for my channel, and I appreciate that. But if you're going to do that, or if you already have, make sure you also hit the notification bell because that way you know when I'm putting out new videos or when I'm doing live streaming because I'm doing that as well. But thank you regardless. And uh, I do appreciate you just checking this video out. And until next time, keep it brutal.